Well, I want to tell you a little bit about my Jewish mother. Almost every Jewish person I know has a Jewish mother. <laughs> Now, I was raised in a really wonderful home in New York City, a uh, very Jewish home. My mom and dad were both Jewish. My grandparents are Jewish. They all came from Russia and Poland, and there were Holocaust survivors all over my family. And, uh, and so I was raised in that kind of environment. Uh, nobody ever told us about Jesus. I don't think anybody thought to tell us about Jesus. And uh, certainly, we weren't looking for Jesus. Jesus was very far apart from us. Uh, in fact, I used to go to my grandmother's home uh, every Sunday morning in Brooklyn, and on the wall she had pictures of all the relatives that I would never meet because they were all killed in the Holocaust. And unfortunately, and really out of ignorance, Jewish people basically blamed the deaths of all of these Jewish people who died on the Holocaust on Christians. Now, I keep telling my family, well, if Christians actually really love Jewish people <laughs> and, and they're supporters of Israel, especially here at Moody Church. And, and so it's not really true, but this is the perception that my mom was raised with. So when I became a believer in Jesus, I knew immediately I, I would have to tell my mother. And it almost kept me from putting my faith in Jesus. But I sort of held my nose and jumped, and I said, okay, if God can save me, then God could make things go smoothly with my mother, which it didn't. <laughs> Maybe it was my approach. It could have been. So I'm a Jesus movement baby, and so I got saved in San Francisco, and went all the way back. My parents were living in New Jersey, and, uh, and I, they weren't expecting me home. I was probably barely 19, and knocked on the door, and, uh, and my mom opens the door, and she's, she looks at me, hair down, all the, I know it's hard to imagine, but <laughs> a lot of hair, beard, and uh, she said, oh, it's so good to say, what are you doing here? You didn't tell us, and, I, and uh, you know, it, it was just so awkward. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Uh, I was a believer. I was very mature as a believer. I was four months old in the Lord, and uh, so I knew exactly what to say. I was well trained in street evangelism, so I knew what to do. And so, uh, hugs and kisses, sat down. My mom says, you're skinny, eat something. So my father came down, my sisters came down, and we're sitting there eating something, and uh, the conversation, of course, comes up, and my mom says, so how long are you here for? What she really will also want to know is, have you stopped doing drugs? Are you selling drugs still? I mean, are we gonna, you going to get our whole house busted or what, you know? So I said, no, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to go back to college. I had already dropped out. And she said, you're going to go back to college. Every, every Jewish mother's nightmare, a college dropout, right? And I said, yeah, I'm going to go back to college. She said, where are you going to go to college? I said, Northeastern College. the Moody of, the North, of New Jersey. She said, you're going to go to where? I said, Northeastern <coughs> Bible College. <laughs> and she stares at me, and my father's down looking at me too, and, and they're both looking at me. And they said, what do you do at a Bible college? I said, you can get a degree in Bible. And the, the next one summarizes my whole life. My mom looks at me and says, you? <laughs> And, and then, of course, the logical question is, what are you going to do when you graduate? Are you going to be a rabbi? I said, well, not probably as you would expect. <laughs> and she said, well, what will you do? And it was that awkward moment now where there was no escaping it. I had to lay it on the table. I had to tell them. And so I took out all my Jesus freak training and I looked at my mom, I looked at my dad, and I said, Mom, Dad, you're both going to hell. <laughs> Do you think that wasn't the right approach? <laughs>
So my mom starts yelling at my father for not raising me religious enough. My father yells at my mother for raising me too religious. So I was sort of secular modern orthodox. It's a long story. And then they looked at me, and I was just sitting there, and I, I had no idea what to say. So I said, you seem upset. <laughs> I said, Jesus has really helped me. I don't do drugs anymore. I don't sell drugs. I'm all cleaned up. And uh, they just looked at me, and she said, okay, number one, you don't tell your grandparents. You don't tell your sisters. In fact, you can't tell anybody. <laughs> And you can't go to church. I don't know. I hadn't even been to church yet, to be honest with you. So that wasn't a problem. I was enrolled in Bible college, but I hadn't been to church yet. So you, and, and you can't go to church, and absolutely no crosses in this house. I said, okay, no, no, no problem. And uh, then I said, do you think maybe I can explain what happened to me? And my mom said, I'll give you one chance. And um, then they began to tell me that, uh, well, we had a little problem because, you know, even as a young believer, I knew that there were some things I had to do that God told me to do, even though I hadn't read them yet in the Bible, that God told me to do that I couldn't say I wouldn't do, like go to church. I knew that was a bad one. And so I knew I'd have to go meet with other believers, and I really wanted to. And so I told them I'd, I'd have to do that. And of course, they then said, then you'll have to leave tomorrow. So I got this chance at night to tell my mom about why I believed. And so I took out my heaviest gun because, um, I, you know, I went to Hebrew school, and uh, I could read the Hebrew Bible, didn't know what the heck I was reading, but I, 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 was, I was zealous. and I said, can I read you one passage, and what does every Jewish believer want to read to their Jewish mother? So I took out Isaiah 53, <laughs> and I, I began reading it to my mother. She fell asleep at verse 7. <laughs> and uh, she had told me, don't talk about Jesus, of course, don't read the New Testament. So uh, she woke up and said, you know, that sounded like Jesus. It literally happened. And I said, well, it is, Mom, but that's Isaiah. He's, you know, he's one of us. <laughs> and she said, I don't care who he is. I said, yeah, I guess you don't want me to finish the chapter. <laughs> and uh, the next day I left. My mom concluded all of this by saying, you had your chance. Don't ever tell me again. Now, Jewish guilt is a wonderful thing. So I had to leave the house. The next day, my mother calls me up at my friend's house, feeling really guilty for throwing me out of the house, and says, you can come back, but you got to abide by the rules. And we, we had a negotiated settlement. And so I came back, and then it's the Jesus movement. You know, within, within a month, I had 40 kids coming to our, her, our living room in a Bible study. Three quarters of them were Jewish, and I was teaching the book of Ephesians, which I had just read. I thought it was pretty neat, so I decided to teach it. God help those kids. <laughs> well, time went by. Eventually, I had to close my Bible study and give it over to a Baptist church. And, and I went to Bible college. I lived in the dorms. And I tried to witness to my mom for a, for a long time. And she was never really ready to hear it. She was raised in such an orthodox home, and my dad in a culturally Jewish home, but very non-religious. So I wasn't making headway with them. And so I looked to the scriptures for encouragement, and I'd like to share with you the encouragement that God used in my life. And I'll tell you one reason why. Number one, I know a lot of you have Jewish friends, and I know that we don't come quickly. It takes a little time and it's a little bit of aggravation. I understand that. Jewish people are not easy because we're not coming from ground zero, we're coming from minus 10. It's not that we're not Christians, it's that we don't want to be Christians. In fact, sometimes the way we define who we are as Jews is by saying we're not Christians because of the bad past. And there's a lot to get over. And so 
I want to speak to those of you who have Jewish friends, but also let's expand it just a little bit. I want, I want to talk to some of you this morning and some of you who are watching. I want to talk to you if you have long-term holdouts in your family. Anybody have a long-term holdout? You've been praying for them for years. You've told them so much about Jesus, they could become a pastor, right? <laughs> but I found in Paul's letter to the Romans, in Romans 9, 10, and 11, I found encouragement from God that I'd like to share with you that God really used in my life, and eventually it helped out in my testimony to my mother. So open your Bibles to the ninth chapter of uh, the book of Romans, a church that Paul didn't plant, made up of Jews and Gentiles. Paul had become the apostle to the Gentiles based on God's call and needed the help of the Roman believers to go to the pagan world in order to reach the Jewish people. I also think that one of Paul's strategies for Jewish evangelism was reaching the Gentiles because if he re reached the Gentiles, he knew that he eventually would reach the Jewish people. Later on, Paul would write that Gentiles are supposed to make Jewish people jealous in Romans chapter 11, 11. So uh, we know that Paul had a strategy in mind. But I'd like to look at Paul's person a little bit, if I may. So what did God do in Paul's life that maybe he can do in your life and certainly he did in my life? Number one, Paul had a broken heart for the salvation of his own people. Before you can preach the gospel, before you even have a burden to preach the gospel, you have to ask God to break your heart. And if God doesn't break your heart, the Jewish people you're trying to talk to will break your heart. And your relatives will break your heart. And I want you to know that a broken heart when it comes to evangelism is really critical. When we have a broken heart, when we have a passion, when we have a burden, then we're better equipped to share the gospel with our long-term holdouts, Jews or Gentiles. So let me read verses 1 and following in Romans 9. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. And here it is that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. So Paul says, no matter what I do, I can't get over my grief because of my relatives and friends and fellow yeshiva students. I can't get over my grief. It plagues me day in and day out. I lay on my bed thinking about the great fruitful ministry I had among the Gentiles, and I realized that Gentiles are coming to faith, but the Jewish people that I love so much are either persecuting me or not listening. And so I have unceasing, unrelenting sorrow in my heart. My heart is broken for my people. And then he nails it in verse 3 so powerfully, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, the Greek word anathema, and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. In other words, Paul expressed his burden. He described it as in this way, that if I could lose my salvation and step out of my relationship with Jesus, and my Jewish relatives could step into that relationship with Jesus, I would give up my position. <laughs> I would, if I can say it bluntly, I would go to hell if one of my Jewish family members could go to heaven. And that was the burden of the great messianic Jewish apostle Paul. He was not just effective. He was not just a powerful preacher. He was not just a marvelous writer. He was a man who had a broken heart for the salvation of his loved ones. Well, years went by, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years. I mean, by the time my mother got through with me, my burden was gone. Because if you're a normal person, and 
people are giving you a hard time all the time, you steal yourself. You become more calloused so that you don't get hurt. And no matter what I did, I was unable to speak to my mother. My dad, I could talk to all day, and at the end of it all, he said, look, Jesus sounds okay, but I don't believe in God, so it's not working. But my mom was a different story. She just wouldn't hear it. I couldn't get to, fr- I tried every missionary trick in the book, even leaving tracks in her bathroom. <laughs> Come on, some of you have done that. But she, but she wouldn't. And so I found that my heart was getting callous until my mother finally announced that she had stage four colon cancer. And I was so stunned that I, I didn't know what to do. But the fact that my mother could more immediately than I ever thought go to her eternal destiny without Jesus, began breaking my heart and ripping my soul apart. Now all I could think about was, of course, praying my mom would get healed, but all I could, stage four is tricky, and I just was praying that that God would do something in her life. Some of you have given up hope. Some of you have become calloused. Don't feel bad. Uh, Jewish people are good at guilt. We are, it's a gift. But I want to tell you, you're normal. But you can't give up. (laughs) You can't possibly give up. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Now, if you have a broken heart, something's going to happen, whether you want it to or not, and that's in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Paul not only had a broken heart for the salvation of his people, but Paul prayed fervently for the salvation of his people. Because when you pray, then you see people and life from God's perspective. And when you pray and you're looking as much to God as you are to the person, the person makes you feel hopeless, but God makes you feel hopeful. They make you feel powerless, but God makes you feel powerful. And so prayer gives you a whole different perspective on the loved one for whose, for whose salvation you're just yearning for. So Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, the Jewish people, is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not in according to or not according to Knowledge, the Greek word epinosis, which means full or complete knowledge. Of course, Jewish people had some knowledge of God. Just look at your Bibles, you know, the thick parts, the Jewish part, you know. So, of course, Jewish people and some of your friends have some knowledge of God, but if they had a complete knowledge of God, then they would look to the one who has completed the Scriptures and the covenants, and that's Jesus. And so, ask God to break your heart, because if, you break, if he breaks your heart, you will erupt in intercessory prayer. Now, I, I've, I've learned something a little bit over the years, and that is, when you don't have a burden, pray anyway. <laughs> because prayer has a way of being God's instrument uh, to make you look at things differently, and to, he uses it to break your heart. So it's a win-win situation. If God breaks your heart and you allow him to do that, you'll pray. If you pray, God will still break your heart. And then last of all is hope. Never lose hope. Paul writes in Romans 11, verse 1, I ask then, God has not rejected his people by no means. Wow, that's the good news. That no matter what people are going through, There's always hope. There's hope because we have a covenant-keeping God who always keeps his word. Now, I understand that salvation is a decision between an individual and, and God. But we can never give up because he, it's his will that all people be saved. Their choice, but it's up to him that all people be saved. And so we can have great patience because until there's a last breath, there's still hope. 
Paul said, I'm an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. In verse 5, Paul brings it up to date. So at the present time, there's a remnant chosen, chosen by God's grace. And you never know. I never know. I never know if a Jewish person's part of the remnant. If you have a Jewish friend who's a long-term holdout, don't give up because you never know. They may be part of God's remnant, and what you're doing is preparing them to make that decision. So there's hope. So I began praying for my mother. Funny thing how it works. Prayer breaks your heart, and it also gives you hope. And I began being hopeful. And there was no medical reason to be hopeful, but I was hopeful. Then something very strange happened. I visited uh, my mother, and I, I had heard about this home health care worker that my mom had gotten. She was assigned to my mom by the insurance. <laughs> and my sisters said, this woman, she really serves your mother. I said, well, that's nice that somebody that the insurance assigns to my mom is serving my mother. She gets paid. And you know, might love her job. And then my sisters began describing her a little bit more, and I said, gosh, I wonder, could this be? <laughs> and so I knocked on the door of my sister's house where my mom was going through chemo and staying with my sister, and this woman opens the door, and I took one look at her. You know how sometimes you just can tell. There's, she radiated. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I, her name was Dominique, and I said, as we walked in, I, I didn't want to break the professional boundaries, but I just said, hey, Dominique, by any chance are you? She says, of course I am. <laughs> I said, you know what I mean. She says, I am a born-again, on-fire Haitian Baptist. God answers prayers in his own ways. <laughs> and I said, oh, you know that my Zahab and I, we're believers too. She says, oh, I know. And I felt really good because I thought we were glowing like her, you know? Unmistakable. I said, how did you know? She said, I saw what you left in your mom's bathroom. <laughs> I said, do you pray for my mom? She says, absolutely, all the time. I said, do you witness to my mom? She says, in my own way. I realized that was a boundary. I needed to stay off that one. I was about to hand her some tracks she could use with my mother. And so time went on. My mom got worse. All of the hope that we had medically was running out. My mom was in the hospital. She was really bad. And uh, something happened. Uh, on one of those nights, you know, when you're, you're on uh, plastic chair duty, you know, when someone's in the hospital and you're just waiting. And as a, as a minister, as a missionary, my, uh, virtually my favorite thing to do is to do hospital visitations. I know people think that's a little nutty, but I love it. There's, it's pretty authentic, every hospital room, you know? People are not hiding from things. And so uh, I was in the hospital with my mom and probably about two in the morning, she jumped up, shouted, God help me. My sister was there with me, and she looked at me and said, brother, that's your uh, job. That's your, your area. And uh, I prayed with my mom, and, and she, she laid back down. But I sensed the presence of God in that moment, as I've rarely sensed before. And I want to tell you, you could almost touch the Lord. In fact, my sister said, what the heck was that? I said, it's hard to explain, but I'd like to explain it to you. The next day, a couple days later, my mom was, was on her very last moments, and uh, we were in the hospital room, and it was me and my two sisters and Dominique and my wife, and my wife and Dominique were talking to my mother over here, and I was talking to my sisters over here, which is a principle of 
Jewish evangelism in hospitals, which you should understand, always brings someone else in to divert the relatives. <laughs> Old trick. And so they were talking to uh, uh, my sisters and, uh, and me, and my mom and Dominique were talking to my mother, and I saw them holding my mom's hand and nodding, and, th and my, my mom was kind of smiling. I had no idea what was going on. And then uh, everybody left, and afterwards, my wife pulled me aside and said, do you want to know what happened? I said, yeah, of course. I, she said, I asked mom, do you believe in God? And my mother squeezed my wife's hand, smiled, and said yes. <sighs> Take me a minute. Then my wife said, and then I asked mom a similar question. I said, do you believe in Jesus? Honestly, in that moment, I wish she had never asked her because I would rather live in doubt than knowing. And she did the same thing. She squeezed my hand and smiled and said yes. Now, why do I tell you this? Because I know that some of you have lost hope. Some of you are rightfully getting callous because you can't help it because it's what happens. And I want to tell you that your long-term holdout relatives and friends and loved ones are never beyond the powerful arm of God to save. Amen. Never. And I want to encourage you not to give up on your Jewish friends. We take a while, and sometimes we take a crisis. But God is always faithful. So never give up, okay? And then remember that wonderful verse that Paul wrote to his beloved Roman believers. So I ask, did they stumble in order to, that they might fall? Speaking of the Jewish people, he says no, by no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. You know what? God used Dominique, an on-fire, born-again, Haitian Baptist who actually told me after my mom was gone, she said, you know, Mitch, this is not my job. It's my ministry. And I pray that God will use you in the same way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the phenomenal words of the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Lord, for, because we see him so much and we feel like we even know him, but sometimes it takes a little bit of effort to see his heart for you and for people. And so, Lord, I do pray that you would use us, strengthen us, and help us to reach those who have heard but have not believed. Help us not to give up, but to pray and to hope. And Lord, uh, use us to be a light to our dear friends and loved ones, that they too might come to know the one whom to know is life everlasting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.